Good morning and welcome to our worship service this morning. We are so glad that you're here worshiping with us separate from the building. We just want to let you know that our cleaning service has been here day in and day out, thoroughly cleaning the carpets, the restrooms, and other areas of the church until ready for your return. I know on that note that many people are eager to know when that could be. As of right now, we will continue to meet on Zoom for the prayer meeting and on YouTube for our worship service. We will look to continue that through the end of May. We will look at the governmental laws and regulations set and will make a definitive date when the government, governor makes his speech about mid-May. We can't wait to worship with you again and we miss the fellowship of congregating together. Lastly, I just want to let you know of ways that you connect with us online. You can find us on our Facebook page at gsbc.org or just type in our church's name into the search bar and like and follow our page. You can also find us on Instagram at Gamble Street. We post weekly updates, we post encouragement and other graphics to keep you guys aware and up to date of what we're doing at the church. So please feel free to like and follow those pages as well. Lastly, we just want to thank you again for worshiping with us and we pray that God touches you in a special way through this service. Thank you and welcome to worship. Let us pray. O God, whose presence is veiled from our eyes, grant that when we do not recognize you, our hearts may burn within us, and that when feeling is lost, we may cling in faith to your word and the power of bread broken in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our call to worship scripture this morning is Psalm 25. Hear the word of the Lord. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and your loving kindness, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your loving kindness, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in justice, and he teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth. To those who keep his covenant and his testimonies, for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. His soul will abide in prosperity and his descendants will inherit the land. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make them know his covenant. My eyes are continually toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. Look upon my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Look upon my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with violent hatred. Guard my soul and deliver me. Do not let me be ashamed, for I take refuge in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem, O Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Our first hymn this morning is hymn 319, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Praise. 
Father, we come before you seeking your forgiveness as we have sinned against you, Father. During this time of quarantine, perhaps we've lost our patience with one another. We haven't loved each other like we should. Father, maybe we haven't really invested in this time to focus on you and grow in faith. Father, I pray that you would forgive us have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from iniquity and cleanse us from sin. Cast us not from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit. Restore us to the joy of our salvation and uphold us with willing spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning's New Testament reading is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And a stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. Jesus therefore said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. Our next hymn is hymn 66, My Shepherd Will Supply My Need.
shepherd will supply my need. Jehovah is his name. In pastures fresh, he makes me feed. Beside the living stream, he brings my
Please join me in prayers. O God of all flesh, we bow before you. We return all the glory to you. You are God on the throne. You are the Lord who never fails. We bless you, Father, for your faithfulness. Father, we thank you for your care. Lord, we bless you for always being there for us. Even in this pandemic, you have proved your sovereignty, you have proved your loving kindness. We return all glory to you in the midst of all of this, Lord, because we believe without out of doubt that you are God in charge, you are God in control, you are the Lord on the throne. Blessed be your name, O Lord. Father, we humble ourselves under your mighty hand at this hour. We pray, Lord, according to the scriptures, that we come down in our time of trouble and, to, and help us in the mighty name of Jesus. For those who have, loved, who have lost loved ones in time like this, we pray, Lord, for your comfort. We pray, Lord, you will stand by them. We pray, Lord, you will wipe away their tears. Let your name be praised. For all who are in the front line, we pray for your protection over their lives, Lord all the medical personnel, or everyone in the front line, all the police, everyone in the front line, Lord, let your presence be visible over them. Take care of them, Lord. Keep them safe as they continue to serve in the name of Jesus. Almighty God, we ask for your healing for all who are already affected, who have been affected with this coronavirus in homes, in isolation centers, in hospitals, in hospices, anywhere they may be. We ask, Lord, that you will visit them with healings on your wings. We ask, O oh Lord, in your presence, that your hand will be upon them and your name alone glorified. We are believing you without doubt that there shall be increase in recovery rates for everyone affected with coronavirus all over the world in the mighty name of Jesus. And we humbly ask, Lord, in your grace and loving kindness, let there be a decrease in death rate, O oh Lord. Let your name be praised. Let this moment be a time, O oh Lord, that men and women, people all over the world, will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. We lift you up, Jesus Christ. Draw all men unto yourself. Father, we pray for the United States of America in time like this. Restore your peace into this land, Lord, into this country. We pray for North America, South America. We pray for Europe. We pray, we pray for Asia. We pray for Africa. We pray for the Pacific. We pray for all the continent, Lord. You are the God of peace. Let there be peace in this world once again. Let your name be praised, Lord. We ask wisdom for our leaders to make right decisions to take right steps, even in time like this. Blessed be your name, O Lord. For everyone online who are worshiping with us, we pray, Lord, you will care for them. Your hand will be upon everyone, you, and your presence will be mighty with us. Lord, we ask with all humility for your Shekinah presence over Gambra Street Baptist Church, over all our members, over all our loved ones. Lord, take care of them. Father, for those who have lost loved ones, let your presence be with them. We use this, this point to pray for the Barnes family over the home call of Virginia King, that Lord, you will stand by them. You will comfort them. You will succor them. Your grace will be sufficient for them. Thank you because you are the Lord on the throne. Every one of us, we, you will meet us at the point of need. Your name alone magnified. We rejoice because you are God in all of this. We thank you because you are God in charge. And we pray, Lord, for the sake of your name, for the sake of the name that is above every other name, let this pandemic come to a close, Lord. Let it come to an end, and let there be peace for your people. Thank you for answer to prayers. Glory be to your name forever. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. me, O oh, bless 
blessed thought O words with heavenly comfort for all Whatever I do Wherever I be Still tis thy hand that leadeth me He leadeth me He leadeth me By his own hand He leadeth me His faithful follower I would be For by his hand He leadeth me Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur nor repine. Content whatever lot I see, still tis thy hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me, his faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won, in death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. By his own hand he leadeth me, his faithful follower I would be, for by his hand, yes, by his hand, for by his hand he me ah yes he leadeth me he leadeth me O blessed thought O words of heavenly comfort fraught whatever I do where'er I be by his own hand, he leadeth me. Ben has reminded us this morning as we hear the words of his, his solo that indeed we are continuing along the pathway of the pilgrim. And as uh, Alan played the spiritual, uh, he didn't, we didn't sing the words. You may know the words. I didn't until I looked them up. But it reminds us of that same pilgrim walk. The spiritual goes this way. I want Jesus to walk with me all along my pilgrim journey. I want Jesus to walk with me. In my trial, Lord, walk with me. When the shades of life are falling, Lord, I want Jesus to walk with me. In my sorrow, Lord, walk with me. When my heart is aching, Lord, I want Jesus to walk with me. In my troubles, Lord, walk with me. When my life becomes a burden, Lord, I want Jesus to walk with me. The picture that we have from both of these songs is something like Jesus walking alongside those two pilgrims, those two disciples on the road to, to Emmaus. You can just imagine 
uh, the fellowship that they had and the fellowship that he offers us today. The theme last week and the week before were related to 1 Peter in chapter 1, and the, the motif that ran through that chapter, we said, was that of the pilgrim. Peter wrote to aliens in a strange land, scattered across what is now today Turkey. Pilgrims. The first pilgrims that landed in America in 1620, just off of Cape Cod at, near Plymouth Rock, there were 120 of them, or 104 of them on that boat on the Mayflower. Uh, John Carver was the man, we think, that wrote the Mayflower Compact. He was the first to sign it, and he was elected as the first governor. What we don't talk about very often of those 104 pilgrims, the pilgrim fathers and mothers, is that 20 of them were servants, 20 indentured servants, one of them who was indentured to John Carver, who died a year later and inherited his estate, was John Howland. He had born, been born in Huntingtonshire in England in a little village called Finstanton. And he had served for about a year, as I said, before John Carver died. And John himself later became a leader in the colony. He became deputy governor later and became the surveyor of the highways that they built. What about the legacy of the Pilgrim Fathers? Uh, statisticians tell us today that maybe as many as 10 million Americans, between about 2.5 and 3% of Americans today are descended from those early pilgrims, those 104. John Howland's legacy is quite a lengthy one and a broad one, over 15 generations. When you look at the 10 children that he had that lived to adulthood, they had seven, he had 78 grandchildren. And today, politicians like the Bush family, the uh, two presidents and Jeb Bush in Florida descend from John Howland, as well as FDR and Sarah Palin and Senator Henry Cabot Lodge. Actors like Humphrey Bogart and the Baldwin brothers and Anthony Hopkins and William H. Macy of Fargo fame, and Christopher Lloyd of Back to the Future, and poets and literary figures in American history like uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and Henry David Thoreau. What a, a long shadow to cast. What a legacy to leave. And it begs the question, what kind of legacy do we as pilgrims leave when we uh, then depart to go to the Father's house? Looking last week at the identity of the pilgrims that Peter talked about, it leads us then to chapter 2 in, in today's text, chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. I'd like to review for just a moment uh, how we come to this point. The motif in chapter 1 that we have chosen to look at is that of the pilgrim. Remember, uh, in the last couple of weeks, we looked at the identity of the pilgrim. Peter tells us that we are born again, and our identity then is that we are born from above and we are then brought into God's family. And we have a living hope, a living hope that focuses on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And through that resurrection, then, we have an imperishable inheritance. Not only is it imperishable, but it is undefiled, it is holy, because he is holy, and it is unfading and it is reserved for us in heaven. That's our identity as the family of God. And then Peter spoke about the legacy that we have as part of his family. The legacy is that of salvation, a salvation that for hundreds of years was not fully understood, even by the prophets, and that legacy that even today angels long to look into, and that legacy is salvation. The message of salvation was a mystery until God revealed it very clearly a mystery how the suffering of his son Jesus Christ could actually come to good, that it would put death to death and it would uh, abolish, not abolish sin, but it would, it would pay for our sin and bring glory to his son Jesus Christ and give us eternal life. His suffering then, the mystery about that is that great good has come to us. That is our legacy, the legacy of salvation. Peter also talks about the attitude that we as pilgrims are to have, even today, to stay focused like a laser beam, preparing our minds for action, keeping a calm spirit in times of trouble and difficulty today as we have a watchful spirit. 
and also to fix our hope not on men, but to fix our hope solely, exclusively on God's grace. As we work through chapter 1 then, we came near the end, we saw that Peter told us what our character as pilgrims is to be like, to behave as God's children, not pressed into the world's mold, not entangled and ensnared by the worldly concerns, but to, to be conformed to his image, that is, to become holy, to be holy like the one who has called us is holy, to behave like God's children. And our conduct, that behavior is to express itself in an alien land as we walk as pilgrims reverently before God. Our conduct is to be fearful, to walk reverently before God, but also to walk reverently among men. And that is a major theme that runs through the second chapter of 1 Peter. And then Peter concluded in chapter 1 with speaking about our obligation to love one another, our privilege to love one another within the body of Christ, because we've been born not of perishable seed, but imperishable seed, which is the living and enduring, undying Word of God. Last week we did not get into chapter 2, but it, it finishes out that pilgrim motif by saying, as children that have been born again, we don't just remain children, but we continue to grow in the Word of God. We grow in our salvation, even here and now, through verses 1 through 3. The second chapter of 1 Peter, in my opinion, shifts gears. It, it moves from the pilgrim idea to that of the servant. There are several themes in the second chapter, but I do see a servanthood thread that runs through all of that. Uh, picking up on the idea from chapter 1 of walking reverently before God and walking reverently among people. We see Peter tells us at the beginning of chapter 2 that we are to walk reverently before God by serving him in verses 4 through 12. The idea is that we're a priesthood. We're a holy priesthood, a spiritual house. We are spiritual stones, and in that spiritual house, we offer sacrifices through Christ to God. So when we worship, we actually serve God. We also serve humans around us. We serve our community around us in being a royal priesthood, he says near the end of that part of First, First Peter 2. As a royal priesthood, we are then to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into the marvelous light. So there is that servant idea of serving God and also serving people around us by being priests. And then Peter moves into another phase where he talks about servanthood as submission. Uh, and uh, a little bit later in the chapter, in verse 13, he talks about submitting to the creations of human institutions, that is, governors and kings, that we are to submit to civil authorities that have been sent by God. That is the legitimate responsibility that we have as servants. He reminds us in verse 16 of chapter 2, we need to be mindful of the fact that while we submit, we are still free men. We are still free women in this society. We live in a country where we are so privileged to enjoy that freedom in a free society. But then the follow-on reminder is, though we're free men, we still remain bondservants. We still remain slaves, not to those authorities, not to the people, the, the boss in the workplace, but we remain bond servants to God alone in chapter 2, verse 16. And then as a consequence, we are to walk circumspectly in all respects, at every level and in every dimension. When you look at uh, chapter 2, verse 17, just before the focal passage for today, it says that we're to honor all people. We are to love the brotherhood, we are to fear God, and we are to honor the king. And that sets the stage then for his talking about the other dimension of servanthood, the other dimension of submission as servants, not just in worldly and earthly society as a whole, but as what will turn out to be the workplace in verses 18 through 25. Would you please read with me now in 1 Peter 2, verses 18 through 25. 
Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor. If for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. For you have been called for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. In this second aspect of submission, after speaking about submitting to the authorities, and then he shifts to servants being submissive to your master, in this passage, verses 18 through 25, there are two or three themes, I think. One is, clearly, we are servants in verse number 18. A second idea is that we are servants with a call, a calling in verse number 21. And then finally, when we look at the whole passage together, verses 18 through 25, we are servants who are called for this purpose. And we are going to take a look at what that purpose is in a moment. Let's take a look first at the idea of our being servants. As Christ followers, yes, we are servants. There are many dimensions of servanthood in Scripture. It's, it's sort of like a diamond with several facets to servanthood. One of those facets, the Bible speaks about the doulos, speaks about being a bond slave. That is literally a slave that is bound to one's master. And that is a biblical concept of servanthood. A person who is not free, a person who is permanently bound to the will of the master. That person's will is the master's will. There's a second dimension to biblical servanthood, and that is that of the table server, or the one who, who serves at the feast, attends the feast. It is the word related to the verb diakoneo, or diakonos. It's a word from which we get deacon. This aspect of servanthood focuses on the service itself, the idea of a person who serves. It could be a person who is a bond servant, a slave, or it could be a free person. And as we said, it's the word from which we get deacon today, the ministers in our church that, that minister to the families, the, the ministers of the church in Acts 6 that were chosen uh, in the early, early church to minister the tables and to minister to the people. There's a third dimension to servanthood in the New Testament, and that is an attendant, the hupertes, an attendant which comes out of a military connotation. The first use of the word was in the Navy for those people that were on a war galley that were the, the oarsmen, the strong uh, oarsmen that pulled the boat through the water and that kind of servitude and service. Later it became an army term, which meant an orderly, an orderly who com uh, attends the commander that is going into battle. Maybe uh, one of his jobs was to be a herald, that is, a messenger that would go from unit to unit and take the commander's orders. A picture that we have in the New Testament of this kind of attendant was John Mark. In Acts, the uh, 13th chapter, uh, he is described as a servant of Paul and Barnabas. He, he did their bidding, he did their errands, and he helped to to serve as a kind of co-herald, if you will. Another dimension of uh, servanthood, a fourth dimension, is a caretaker. A caretaker or a therapon. It's related to the word therapuo, the caretaker of the household. In Hebrews, the third chapter, Moses is described as this kind of therapon, that is, caretaker of God's household. 
He did so very faithfully, the author of Hebrews tells us, in passing on the word of God in his house. The medieval picture that we have of this would be something like a squire or a page, one who then tends to the needs of the knight that helps to provide for him and prepare him for battle. It's related, of course, to the word today that we use, therapeutic, that relates to the medical field. That is, the doctor who tenderly takes care of his or her patient. The word that is used here when it says, servants, submit to your masters, in this context is that fifth dimension. It is the oikotes. Uh, Oikos is the word for house in Greek. It, It means the person that is the household manager. It's very similar to the other word therapon, but it's close, more closely related to the idea of being a slave, the household slave. It could be a free man or it could be a bond servant. Uh, it's used in several places in the New Testament, though, to, to be a slave. Jesus uses this term that is found in verse number 18 in Luke, the 16th chapter, and also in Matthew's gospel in the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, no servant, oikotes, no servant can serve two masters. He can't serve both the world and God. He will, he, he simply can't be divided that way. He will please one and not please the other. He will hate one and love the other. He cannot be of a divided mind. In Acts the 10th chapter, this word is used to describe the servants in Cornelius' house. You might remember that Cornelius sent three people to go retrieve Peter from Joppa and to bring him then to proclaim God's message to him. And he sent a military, he sent a soldier, and he sent two servants, and they were these kinds of servants. Uh, The emphasis here in this term that is used in the second chapter of 1 Peter is relationship. This, the emphasis is on the relationship of that servant to the household. He is a member of the household. It, he's not, he is not an outsource. He's not somebody that lives outside and then comes into the house. He, he lives with the family and he has a, a deep and abiding relationship with the family. And often that person was a bond slave, but not always. The modern equivalent to this would be a uh, servant in the workplace. You and I, as we serve wherever we are in the workplace, under a, uh, a manager of, of sorts. When Peter talks about servanthood uh, in his writings, there, there are three dimensions uh, to that servanthood. This is one of those. Elsewhere, he speaks about a spiritual dimension. In chapter 2, earlier, he has reminded us that we ultimately serve God. So one aspect of our servanthood as servants of Christ is obviously spiritual. At the beginning of chapter 2, he says that we, we're living stones, we're, we're a holy priesthood, we're a royal priesthood. But when he talks about that holy priesthood, he says that we are in God's house of living stones. We offer sacrifices to God. We serve God. And then later in that chapter, in verse 16, when he says we're bond slaves to God. So one aspect for Peter of servanthood is spiritual. Another aspect is ministerial. In chapter 4, in verse 10, he speaks about serving this way. He says, use the gift that is given to you. And I think there he's talking about the spiritual gift that we have. And it may be, be more than one. And also the gift of salvation that we have. Use that gift that God gives you in order to serve. And he uses that word related to deacon, diakoneo. And then he goes on to say, as good stewards, and he uses another word for servant, which means a household steward, as of God's grace. So we are to use the gift that God gives us ministerially to serve others in exhibiting God's grace. So there is a spiritual dimension to servanthood. There is also a ministerial dimension. And then there is what Peter describes in this part of chapter 2 as being a social dimension. That is, we serve humankind in the institutions that are created amongst men and women um, in our society that are sent by God, governors and kings, yes, in verse 13. And there's also the social dimension of being in the workplace, and that is the context for today's passage. We as the oikotes, that is, the servant in the workplace, 
Then it was in the home. Now it's out there where we are in the workplace under those that are, we might say, boss or our manager in verse 18. Yes, we are servants with all of these different dimensions, spiritual, ministerial, and social. We're also servants who are called. The word there in Greek sounds like the English word, kaleo, kaleo. We are called. We're called for purpose. This, the second focus here of Peter in verse number 21 is that we are servants who are called. Our calling is not our identity. It, it's different. The identity, the base for that has been laid in chapter 1. We are born again. We are in God's family with an inheritance that is imperishable in chapter 1. That, that's our identity. We're God's children. We may describe it different ways. We may say we're Christians. We may say we're Christ followers. We may say that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. There are many ways to express that relationally. But we are part of God's family. We're his children. That's our identity. Our calling is also not the roles that we fulfill in that family. That's different. Peter speaks about his roles in, in his two letters. He defines his role at the beginning of chapter 1 in the first letter. In verse 1, he says that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. He, he is a born-again member of God's family identity, and one of his roles is as an apostle. In 2 Peter chapter 1, he expands that. He describes himself as a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. In chapter 5, he gives us another dimension of his role in life. He speaks to the elders that, to whom he's writing, and he says, as a fellow elder, he speaks to the el other elders and, and tells them how then to manage the house of God. Those are roles that Peter talks about. He also fulfilled these other roles I'm about to mention, but he describes roles that we as Christ followers fulfill. The, the pilgrim role that we talked about the last couple of weeks in chapter 1, and then again in chapter 2, verse 11, uh, Pilgrims, aliens, and strangers in a land that is not our own. We've just described another role. We're priests. We're a priesthood of all believers. We're a priesthood of every believer in God's house. We're living stones. That's another role. We are obedient free men in society. Chapter 2, verse 16. Not only are we free men there, but we are also, another role, bond slaves of God and of God alone. And in this passage... We are servants. We are servants that are stewards that come under masters of the house. So if our calling is not those roles, and if our calling is not our identity, what is this calling about? I think the calling is this. It, it's God's call to walk with him in the pathways of life. To walk with his son, Jesus Christ. He leadeth me, O blessed thought. As we walk with pilgrims, we walk with him. Where are the pathways that he takes you? And what does he call you to do on those pathways? Where and how God calls us to walk with him? What's God's purpose for you in life today, in your calling? Peter speaks, I think, very explicitly about five different aspects of calling in, in his writings in, in 1 Peter, using the word kaleo, kaleo <laughs> explicitly. This is one of them. There are four others. One of those is found in chapter 1, verse 15. It's the calling of character. And there, remember, we are called to become holy, for he who has called us is holy. It's a calling of character. There is a calling of mission that Peter speaks about in chapter 2. That calling of mission is to testify. Remember, he says that we then are to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So that's a calling of mission. There's also a calling of ministry that Peter tells us about in chapter 3. This calling of ministry is to be a blessing. Very much like Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount when he talks about the Beatitudes. He, sp he says that we are blessed in many ways. The implication there is that we are blessed so that we might bless others with those same blessings. Peter puts a fine point on it here in chapter 3 verse 9. He says that we are called to bless others 
And the great and wonderful promise is not just to bless others, and that's great, it's a privilege, but also eventually we are called then to receive the blessing, the inheritance of eternal life. There's a fourth dimension to this calling, too, elsewhere, and that is the call to eternal glory. It consummates in this. The call to eternal glory is to dwell with him, to dwell in the Father's house, which is Jesus' language in John 14. But in 1 Peter 5, this calling to eternal glory, he says this. He says, you will suffer, but though you suffer for a little while, ultimately you will be called home. You'll be called to your ultimate glory. So these callings are how we walk in life and where we walk in life and, and walking with the Lord. Our identity is as God's children. We have roles that we fulfill in that calling, but these are the pathways of life. And he talks about one of those pathways here in chapter 2, verse 18 through 25. What is our calling that's described here? What is this purpose that he speaks about here? We're not only uh, servants, we're not only called, but we're called to this purpose. What is this purpose? What is this section of the second chapter about, verses 18 through 25? What's the central idea? Well, yes, the idea of submission is there. Yes, we as Christ followers are called as servants, and we do submit to authority. There's no question about that. The word literally means that we are ordered under by ordered what I mean there isn't not commanded but we are set in order we are set in order under we are arranged in an orderly manner in in a subordinate fashion under one who leads us under authorities who lead us it comes from a Greek military term that indicates just that the commanders would take their troops and they would then arrange them in an orderly manner so that they could deploy into battle and win the victory to follow the commander in an orderly way. You must have discipline in military ranks in order to accomplish the mission. There was a non-military uh, meaning of this in the ancient world too. And it, it meant the voluntary attitude that people have. People of different walks of life maybe in different, different areas of the community. They come together in the community in an orderly way so that they can cooperate to bear the burden together. So it's, it's a voluntary gathering together to cooperate, to accomplish something, to accomplish a mission, and to bear the burden. And the extent and the conditions of this submission for Christians is pretty clear in verse number 18. What is the extent? Any legitimate authority, we are to submit to that authority. Any legitimate master that God has sent into our domain under whom we serve, we should submit. There's no question about that. Regardless of their disposition, Peter has a wonderful way of putting this. He says, whether they're good or kind, good and kind, that is good, they're pleasant, they're agreeable, they're honorable, they're upright, kind, they're, they're moderate in their temperament, they are, they're, they, uh, they're fair, they're pleasing, they're easy to get along with. That, that's easy to do. But then Peter gives us a hard saying, even if they're unreasonable, and the word there is a pretty strong word. It, it's the word from which we get scoliosis. It, it really means crooked. Even crooked leaders were to follow. Those that, in the King James Version, it says are fraward. Well, what does that mean? Perverse or unfair, crooked, uh, not likable. Even we are to follow them. That's hard to swallow, but it's true. If, a, if the authorities, if the boss is somebody we don't like, maybe it's an elected official that we don't like at all, whatever party, whatever background we're from, if they are legitimately elected and put into position, if they're sent by God to be in that position, we are then to submit. But what does submit mean? Well, let me, let me treat it negatively first before we come to what I think it really does mean. What I think it does not mean is this. In relational terms, it doesn't mean that we are servile. It doesn't mean that we are merely slaves to men or to women. No. No. Peter tells us in verse 16, we are free men. We're free men. 
We live in a country, as we said, where we, where we have those freedoms. There, there are some countries where people do not live as free men and women. What a privilege it is. But we must be reminded that no one is our absolute boss. Nobody is our absolute despot in those terms. Only God is our, is our uh, authority, final authority. We are bond slaves only to God. So in relational terms, though there are people that have authority over us and we operate in those institutions, they themselves are accountable to God as well. It's not a mental kind of submission that says this, I check my mind out at the door. It's not a mindless total obedience. It's not submitting to power-crazed autocrats, dictators who claim to have absolute authority. They need to remember that they too come under the authority of God, that they have been sent into a position of authority and he is the one that is in control. I remember uh, at one of my workplaces one time, I had a disagreement with uh, my supervisor and he knew that I was a military person, that I, at that time, I was in the, in the Army, I was in the Reserves. And he said, Spivey, don't you know, you're a military man, don't you know that you ought to know how to take orders? The implication being there, what I tell you, you do regardless. Don't give it another thought. I know what's right. Well, the problem with that is, of course, nobody's perfect. And we have a responsibility as subordinates to tell those who are authorities over us when something's going wrong to help them so that they might lead in a better way. And I'm not saying that I was necessarily right in that situation, but, you know, we do have a responsibility to speak up and to help our leaders lead more effectively. When I was a young officer, I was told uh, that I would join the officers club. I was a first lieutenant. The commander of the school that I was serving in was a colonel. He was four grades, four ranks above me. And I had my reason for not joining the officers club. He thought it was because I didn't want to pay the dues. And he literally called me in on the carpet. And he said, I've, I've given you an order to, to join the officers club. And I said, well, sir, with, with due respect, I cannot accept that order. And he said, well, why not? And then I told him, because in that day and time, back in the, even in the 70s, in the officers club, it was a place where many people went simply to drink and to carouse, and I was not going to be a part of supporting that. And when I expressed that in a rational, reasonable way, he accepted it, and he respected my opinion, and, and he, he allowed me then not to obey his, his order in that respect. My point is this. Submitting to authority is not checking our mind at the door we must be responsible to give our input in an appropriate and respectful way. We know that. Submission is, has a moral dimension to it, too. It's not blindly doing whatever we are told to do if it leads to some kind of illegal activity or moral misbehavior. We obey only lawful orders in line with God's Word. You know, in Nazi Germany, that's an obvious example, I think, where a large part of a whole society fell into lockstep uniformity with, with, uh, with Hitler. Martin Niemöller describes what this was like. There came a time when one must speak up, and many people did not. First, they came for the socialist, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. There comes a time in the context of authority, those that give us orders, when we must speak up when the activity becomes illegal or immoral. And another thing that this submission is not in the context of the church it's not someone in the church, a church leader, who usurps Christ's authority. There is one head of the church, and he is Jesus Christ. God sends leaders in the church, pastors, shepherds, under-shepherds, deacons, ministers in the church that may, they may not have a title or position, but, but they're leaders that God sends to guide us and to teach us and to help us to accomplish the, his kingdom purpose. But when we have a leader in the church or leaders in the church that demand submission from church members, they demand submission because they are the authority, the more they demand it, 
I can guarantee the less authority they actually exercise because it is illegitimate. There is only one who is the head of the church. Dictatorial pastors who say my way or the highway are not exercising legitimate authority. And when we are told to submit to to them, uh, I bring into play all those other questions that I have raised earlier about the moral and the legal and the mental uh, aspects of it. No, the primary purpose of submission is different. It's not to exalt the person in the position of authority. It's not to push down and keep people in lowly servile submission. No, it is for what? It is for good order. It is for discipline. It is for cooperation so that we might accomplish kingdom purpose. It's for good order and good discipline so that we might have peace in society. And this pleases God when we then submit in that respect and we have a peaceful society that honors him. But still, this submission is not this purpose of this passage. A lot of people look at this passage and they say, this is all about submission. That's not the purpose of this passage. That is not our calling. No, it's just the social context within which we, we uh, actually fulfill our divine calling. What is this purpose? What is this calling and the purpose of it? It's very simple. It's found in verse number 21. And it is to follow Christ. To follow Christ. To be like him. To be conformed to the image of the Father by being transformed in the image of Christ. What did Jesus do? He submitted. Yes, he submitted to the worldly authorities. He submitted without protesting. He submitted silently. He submitted as a lamb who went to the slaughter. He submitted. But he did not obey them. He did not follow their crooked ways. He did not do the things that they told him to do. He did not conform to the pattern of this world. He obeyed God. He obeyed his father. He did his father's will. And for that, he suffered. He suffered for doing right. He suffered for doing right by dying on the cross. He suffered for doing right by dying on the cross for you and for me. As the suffering serpent prophesied by Isaiah, he was called for this purpose. You see, his purpose for coming is found in verse number 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you have been healed. For by his wounds, I have been healed. He was called for this purpose to pay for my sins so they might be canceled out. He was called for this purpose that he should and did die on the cross to put death to death. He was called for this purpose that he might be raised from the tomb on the third day and have victory over sin and death. He was called for this purpose so that he might be glorified and also in that glorification offer the promise, not just the hope, but the promise of eternal life. He submitted, but he did not obey this world. In the same way, we're called for this purpose. What is this purpose? If anyone would come after me, Jesus said, that person must die to self and take up his or her cross and follow me. One passage says, take up your cross daily and follow me. Take up our cross as he did. Do what is right, regardless of the circumstances, we obey God and we do the Father's will. We, oppo- we oppose the scoliosis of this society, that which is crooked. We do not obey mindlessly masters who would lead us astray. And when they command us to do one thing and we cannot do it, then we must pay the price. That means, in fact, we may be called to suffer. Suffer the consequences of doing right for the sake of conscience. That is our purpose, to follow Christ. Christ. So let me apply this in a couple of ways. What are a couple of the applications? I think the first is this idea of suffering as servants. We're called into a fellowship of servant suffering. The first part of that fellowship of servant suffering is this. It's a promise. Jesus knows and cares. 
Jesus knows and cares the suffering that you may be experiencing this very moment. And he calls you to walk with him, to take his hand. He promises to walk with you as a pilgrim. I must tell Jesus all my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever cares and loves his own. I must tell Jesus all my troubles. He's a kind and compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver, make of my troubles quickly an end. Tempted and tried, I need a great Savior, one who can help my burden, help me with my burdens to bear. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. He all my cares and sorrows will share, will share. He walks with us and he talks with us, as Ben said and as Alan played. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear these burdens alone. Jesus can help me and Jesus alone. That's one aspect of the fellowship of a suffering servant. The other is this, we are called in to bear the burden of suffering with him. Paul put it this way in Philippians, the third chapter, that I may know him and know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, taking up his cross and taking up our cross. There's a second application to this, and it is the title of the sermon. That is the, the, the legacy of, the, of a servant. What is the legacy of a servant? What is your legacy as a servant of Jesus Christ? In 1 Peter, we see a couple or three pictures here in closing. One is that of a beacon. That is a a light. Light bearers in a dark world. Remember in the second chapter, in verse 9, he he says that we we should proclaim the excellencies of him who called us. That is our calling. Out of the darkness into the marvelous light. We are to be the light of the world. Jesus works through us as the light of the world. He is the light of the world, and he calls us to be not only salt, but to be light, to be light bearers. A second word picture, I think, of this kind of legacy is path straighteners, to make the crooked path straight. That is, like John the Baptist a voice of one calling in the wilderness makes straight the way for the Lord. Peter did this. At Pentecost, Luke gives an account after the sermon and after he then tells them that they must repent of their sins and then proclaim Christ as Lord. It said that he solemnly testified, Peter did, and kept on exhorting them saying, be saved from this crooked generation. We are called to be pathfinders and path straighteners for Christ. And a last picture I would share about our legacy, I think. What legacy will you leave? Virginia King uh, was a member of our congregation for many years here at Gambrel Street. All of you in Gambrel Street remember Virginia. She sat right there, eight rows back, to my left, near the center. Virginia, we celebrated her 100th birthday last November the 10th. She was born on Monday the 10th of November 1919. Her husband, Ken King, passed away in 2015, almost five years ago. Virginia was born in Arkansas, moved to Oklahoma, grew up there, then she moved to Fort Worth, and she was a student at Southwestern Seminary, as Ken was too, back in the early 50s. She served as the administrative assistant at Tarrant Baptist Association, and they met, and they courted, and they married on the 12th of May in 1953 at Diamond Hill Baptist Church here in Fort Worth. They were married for 62 years years. What a legacy. A legacy of marriage and children and grandchildren, yes. Of generations to come. An even greater legacy than that, a spiritual legacy. Uh, They were in the pastoral ministry together as a team for over 55 years. They served in churches in Texas and Oklahoma and Wisconsin and New Jersey and Virginia and then settled back in Lufkin, Texas where They ministered as a hospice team for several years. What a legacy. 
They founded their ministry on this touchstone. I remember at uh, the memorial service that we had for Ken five years ago. 2 Peter 2, 4 through 5. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That was the touch tone of their ministry. Ken put it this way. This was his testimony. Virginia and I have been working as earthly assistants to the heavenly stone master. It has been our privilege to witness the selecting, the fashioning of a great many living stones our Lord Jesus Christ has chosen to use in the perfecting of his spiritual house. Along our pastoral ministry pathway, we have been privileged to see that we've had some small part in this great construction process. At the same time, we have ourselves been objects of that selection, fashioning, and some spiritual polishing ourselves. When we come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you see, he comes into our life. He offers, he requests, and he ultimately requires for all whose lives will know true fulfillment that he he shall not be only a cornerstone, but the chief cornerstone. What a legacy. Virginia departed at 3 o'clock this past Wednesday, 3 o'clock in the morning, to go to the Father's house. She is in the Lord's presence today, and she is with Ken, and they await our coming someday. That circle is not broken. What a legacy for generations to come. What is the legacy that you leave as a pilgrim who walks through this life as a servant of Jesus Christ? Are you a beacon? Are you a light? What is your legacy? Are you a, uh, are you a pathfinder? Do you straighten crooked paths so that people might come to know Christ? Are you a stone? Are you a stone in the spiritual house of God's servanthood where he calls you to be a priest in a holy and a royal priesthood to proclaim his excellency so that you might be a part of calling people out of darkness into his marvelous light? God calls you to that kind of legacy, to the legacy of Virginia and Ken King, to the legacy of many saints that have gone before My prayer is this week that whatever he calls you to do, whatever pathway you walk, wherever you go, that you will be a beacon, you'll be a path clearer, and you will be a priest of the Lord Jesus Christ to those in need. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you have called us as pilgrims in this life to follow follow you, to walk with your son Jesus Christ hand in hand, and the great privilege that is, and the great reassurance and promise that no matter what suffering we have, whether it's suffering physical and emotional because of the problems that we struggle through in life, or whether it's because we suffer because we do that which is right, and we're called to bear our cross in that respect, that you will help us to be faithful in that calling for this purpose to follow Christ wherever we go. And our prayer is now that as we move through these days of difficulty and and darkness and despair, that you will help us to see the light, not at the end of the tunnel, but that you will help us to see the light of Jesus Christ, that you will call us then to help to bring people to that light through the darkness of the world around us. May he be glorified, and may you be honored and be praised in all that we do this week, and may you keep us safe and sound until we meet again. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but lost and pour contempt on all my pride. And the hymn that we sing together as we close finishes this way. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were present far too small. Love so amazing so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. That's the best we can do, is to give him our all. May God bless you this week and keep you and your family safe and well. 
Our hymn of reflection is hymn 186, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Benediction today is from Hebrews 13, 20 through 21. Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. We're so glad that you found us on YouTube. Other ways that you can stay connected with us is through our Facebook page. You can find us by going to the search bar and typing in gsbc.org or Campbell Street Baptist Church. It will be the logo with the green signature. You can also find us on our Instagram page at Gamble Street. We post encouraging videos, scripture verses, updates, and more. So please feel free to like and share each of these pages. If you have a prayer request or need, we would love to hear you and pray for you. We do have a prayer meeting that meets every Wednesday at 6 p.m. via Zoom. If you would like to be part or do not know how to be a part, please email me at the mottos at gamblestreet.org and we would love to let you know how you can join. If you do have any other prayers, needs, or concerns, always reach out to me at mottos at gamblestreet.org or to suit us at letro at gamblestreet.org. Lastly, we just want to remind you of different ways that you can give online. We're so glad that we have this option here at Gamble Street, and we just want to let you know how to do that. We cannot continue our ministry during this time to its full capacity without your generous tithes and offerings. A couple ways you can do that is by going directly to our website at gamblestreet.org and going to the Give section. You can also download our app at Church by Ministry One and type in our church's name and go to the Giving section. Both of these options go to the exact same place and is very safe and secure. Lastly, you can send a check to our address and Ken will pick it up at the post office every Tuesday. Thank you again for worshiping with us this morning and we hope that you have a safe and blessed week.